Dean Metcalf, he is the producer of the nationally syndicated morning radio show, The Bob and Tom Show, and he joins us for today's podcast. Dean, I'm a, uh, I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller. Thanks for uh, making some time today, man. Huh, well, I never made the connection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For, for those that uh, don't know what a radio producer does uh, day-to-day, what are your responsibilities for the show? Well, that's a fine question. Uh, a job description. See, they never really gave me one. So <laughs> it's uh, it it actually um, the word you know the job title producer can mean so many things, so many places. Um, and it really does vary. Um, uh, in our case, uh, originally when I started, I started there. 32 years ago mm. I was just a little puppy uh right out of school and uh or still finishing college and uh I started out you know just editing uh some tapes this is back when the show was actually on you know old reel-to-reel tapes uh-huh. and uh yeah cutting up audio and making uh, daily uh, promos uh, you know little uh snips to um promote the show and then you know taking um taking the audio and grabbing uh, some of the comedians and some of the, you know, the best parts of the show and isolating those uh, for replay and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, it kind of expands into um, then, you know, booking guests and talking to, uh, to different listeners and that kind of stuff, like answering the phones, um, answering mail and email and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so as, as the show grew and things changed, um, through the years, I mean, the early days I could have did everything just cause it was a, you know, small, smaller operation. Right. And, and then as we expanded and, uh, got bigger, um, you know, we had a, a bigger staff to, uh, kind of do some of that stuff. So really my, my day to day stuff is really more, uh, like being a, Oh, like an air traffic controller or whatever, kind of <laughs> sitting there, uh, kind of, you know, uh, checking phone calls and, uh, you know, texts and all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, with the listeners and all that, but then also dealing with our different uh, guests and getting them set up nowadays, getting them set up for zoom. Um, right. Yeah. You know, all the interviews via zoom cause we can't have people in the studio. Um, and really being in, in communication with Tom, uh, back and forth uh, as the host, uh, kind of keeping him, you know, uh, in the loop of either what's going on coming up or whatever, or basically just kind of filling his needs. He'll let me know some audio that he needs or whatever, and we'll grab that. But yeah, it's just, it's there's a kind of a variety of things. And at this point, we've been doing it so long, it's kind of this well oiled machine where we all just kind of know what to do and what's going on. So you don't even really think about a lot of it too much as far as you know uh, who's doing what everybody just kind of jumps in and does what they need to do kind of a routine at this point for you yeah yeah it really is i mean it's just yeah everybody kind of you know we've been doing it together so long that a lot of it is just like this unspoken communication yeah Uh, and and like with anybody uh, lots of uh miscommunication and uh, (laughs) um you know, non-communication where it's like, what? What would you? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that too. Uh, kind of take me back to when you first kind of got introduced to Bob and Tom and the show. Uh, how did you get brought in to be a part of the program? Well, it's a it's a crazy um, crazy thing that happened. Uh, just this weird fate kind of thing. A, a friend of mine from high school had done an internship with uh, the show. And I was still in college. Let's see, we were, yeah, probably senior year of college. So I, I hadn't talked to this guy in probably at least three years or so. And uh, and I heard that he was doing an internship with the Bob and Tom show. And uh, I thought, oh, man, that's really cool. You know, that'd be, you know, I'd like to talk to him about it and see what that's like. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, no, that's kind of, I'm not that kind of, you know, guy that's just going to call him up, you know, hey, I haven't talked to you in a long time, but I want to know, <laughs> you know, so I just thought, oh, whatever. And it was weird, like two weeks later, out of the blue, he called me, um, this, this buddy of mine, because he just, you know, he was just wanting to chat, and he was, uh, he was going to Butler uh, University, I was going to IU, and we were both, you know, studying telecom, radio, so he was just wanting to talk and everything, and uh, he was all excited, because he was 
working on the Butler radio station. He goes, well, why don't you come on up and check out my, you know, the radio studio. And yeah. so we're talking and I asked him about this Bob and Tom thing. And he goes, oh yeah, you know, it was fun. You know, just call Tom and tell him, you know, me. And, you know, I was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> the next day, like a Monday morning after the show, I just call up there. Hi, can I talk to Tom Griswold? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I mean, that would never happen today, you know, but the reception's like, okay, yeah, hang on. You know, and <laughs> A few minutes later, oh, yeah, this is a Tom Griswold. Oh, hi, <laughs> I'm from Alex, and he said, uh, you might need an intern. You know, it's like, yeah, um, yeah let's well, call up and start Friday. So it was just this crazy thing that happened where, you know, just this opportunity that was just dumb luck. Um, but then uh, what happened was we, we really connected, and um, – uh, it, he he kind of realized uh, that I had uh, a similar sense of humor and kind of understood uh, kind of the way the show worked and what they liked and all that. So he uh, he made a point of um, you know kind of getting me part time um, some part time work uh, at the radio station yeah. and all that. We just kind of stayed connected um, after that. So it took it took quite a while to actually get on as a, a full time employee just because there weren't any any real positions there but uh but once once it happened that you know it's just a, a career that i never could have imagined because i i wasn't interested in radio or anything i just thought oh this would be a fun little internship i was going to go off and work in um, tv production and uh, next thing you know it's 32 years later and i never got out of there if you could do an, another job besides the the bob and tom show what would be ideal for you a tough question i mean i think um like this job what's what's really great about this i've always said i've got the best job in the world because i don't have to do just one you know it's not like a factory job where you're doing one little thing over and over and over and over all day it's a variety of things Mm -hmm. um and so that's that's you know what I like about it is it's kind of you know it's it's different um, different things going on, um, but yeah I think that if if I hadn't done this I I kind of assume I would have tried to find something in TV production or that kind of thing, but as far as like if if I left if I had to leave there today or whatever what would I do um, I don't think I'd want to work in you know, radio or broadcasting again, even though, uh, that's, you know, what I'm most qualified to do and right. uh, would probably be the, the easiest thing to jump to. But, uh, I, I think I would like, I would, I would almost like to try teaching, uh, or doing something like that where, um, just something different, uh, than what I was doing, but maybe that'd be able to use, you know, some of those skills, uh, that might transfer over to that. And, uh, just you know working with either kids or you know young adults or whatever um that are and not even necessarily like teaching broadcasting or whatever but right uh, yeah but just some kind of teaching so maybe maybe something like that i don't know well my professors always told me if you can teach the material then you've mastered it and i'm sure at this point you would be i if i walked in and you were my professor i, I would like it right away i can tell you right now <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it, it depends. Be... It depends. You know, if I decide, you know, really stick it to you, give you all the hard homework, <laughs> and just you know, yeah, give you a hard time. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, but I, I mean, the way things played out for you is so. Um, it, it hardly ever happens in today's world with modern technology and so many options with podcasts like this. What advice would you have for someone that's trying to pursue a career in radio and entertainment in general in today's world? Yeah, I mean, and you're right. In today's world, it is. It's it's a lot different and a, a lot more a lot more opportunities in some ways, um, but a lot fewer opportunities in other ways. So yeah, back when 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 I was doing it, when I started, you know, there was, there was no, uh, there essentially was no internet. <laughs> there yeah. was no, you know, podcasting, all that kind of stuff. It, it just wasn't there. So the only, the only place you could do that, that kind of stuff was in actual broadcast, you know, radio. Um, so now with, uh, with all those opportunities, you know, kind of doing what you're doing, having your own podcast, doing that kind of thing, great experience and all that. 
the more general advice that I would give people, um, just from my own experience is just to, you know, take any and every opportunity that you can find right. and, and keep that open mind because you have no idea what you're going to end up doing. I mean, you, like I say, in my case, I thought, oh, I'm going to go off and do television production. I, I didn't have any interest in radio specifically. You know, it's like, uh, you know, yeah, that'd be kind of fun or whatever, but it wasn't uh, like a goal or anything. But because of taking that internship and then realizing, wow, this is, you know, this is pretty fun and, and uh, I, I like this environment mm-hmm. and, and keeping my mind open to that. Um, you know, that led to this whole other world that I never would have predicted. And and I have plenty of friends that, you know, uh, that I went to college with that, you know, went off and realized pretty quickly, you know, it's like, man, either I, I can't find a job doing this or I've tried this. And I don't really like it. And so that they would, you know, spin off and go into, you know, some other career or some other uh, right. business thing. And, and I think that when you're young, you know, there are definitely people out there that have just a real clear passion for, you know, I am going to be a fill in the blank and they're going to pursue that with all their might, you know, and, and that's great. And a lot of times that can, you know, that'll work. Uh, but I think there's so many more people that are, uh, the way I was where it's like, no, I don't know exactly what I'm going to be when I grow up, you know? And so you you know, gotta gotta keep that open mind of uh, and keep your eyes open and kind of try some things out, and um, yeah, and and that's I, I think that's also the, the the beauty of like an internship or you know little part time jobs that you do or job shadowing any of that kind of stuff where you get an opportunity to try some stuff out, yeah, and and, and see what it's like you know because it's like a it's a great little test run where you can you know try it on without without, uh, you know, uh, making a huge commitment uh, and all that. And you can kind of see, it's like, oh, gee, it turns out I don't like this at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and let's let's be honest about it, too. I mean, at some point, you do have to have some kind of skill set. But having an internship, having the connection that I had with Dad being part of the Bob and Tom Band, that's just by, you know, uh, random possibility. But getting access yeah. to guys like yourself... Uh, that that's invaluable. Just having them as soundboards to bounce content ideas off of. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and you know, as much as you know, it, we 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 love the idea of you know everybody's got an equal chance to, to you know blah blah blah. Right. It, it really does. A, a lot of it boils down to you know who you know. And those kind of connections in life. And, and just like with, you know, with my situation, it's just because this guy that I knew had, you know, connected with them and had, you know, just that little foot in the door. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so if, if for people that just don't have any of those connections or resources or whatever, it makes it a lot tougher. But at the same time, if they've got, you know, that drive and everything to go out there and knock on those doors or, you know, try to get somebody's attention that, you know, can, if just anything that'll set you apart, get your foot in the door, you know, that's that first step. But then there's that second part where, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta be able to bring the goods. Yeah. <laughs> and so you gotta have, you know, some kind of you know talent or intelligence, that kind of thing. And again, that's yet again, that's only part of it then yeah then and to me this is like one of the biggest things that you can't really teach you know you can't really learn but just that chemistry and that being able to work with people and and, and that's you know whenever i talk to uh, interns um, or uh, you know anybody young doing that I, I try to you know impress that upon them like you one of the most important things you can get out of an internship is learning how to work with people, you know, learning how to kind of read the room, you know, and figure out, okay, what do they want from me? Yeah. You know, so that, so that you can, you know, either be, you know, Johnny, you know, on the spot, go get her, you know, jumping in and da da da, or being, you keep your mouth shut and you wait and listen for them to tell you what to do. Right. You know, and if you can kind of read people and learn how to, you know, 
to, to do whatever they want you to do and that you're a, a decent guy to work with, you know, a personality and all that kind of stuff. That's just, it's huge. Um, and, and again, it's, it's tough because you, you can't really teach that stuff and different personalities, you know, mesh together in different ways. Um, certainly, you know, I've met a lot of people in radio and, you know, broadcasting and other businesses and you know what it's like, you know, you'll, you'll be around a, a, a few people or a, you know, a, a specific person, group of people, whatever. And you just think, Oh my God, I could never work with that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. You know, but, but there are other people who are like, you know, yeah, that guy's perfect. This is great. You know? Oh yeah. It, yeah, so finding you know finding your community, finding your family, that kind of thing. That's it's tough, and man, when it when it happens, you know you you feel so lucky, and uh, you know that's why that's why maybe you stick around a place thirty two years or so. Yeah, and we'll we'll get into some of your favorite moments. I know you don't like to rank things, but I do want to know some of your uh, <laughs> your favorite moments from the show. But before that, I I just want to say uh, you're so right. And one thing that I think makes you a, a fantastic producer is when I shadowed you, you talked about being active and ready to jump in if needed, but having the awareness to kind of sit back and not interfere. That's kind of what a producer does day to day. Yeah, yeah, that, and and you know that that's part of that whole thing of being a a, a team player yeah. uh, and all that is, you know, being you, uh, being confident enough and all that to go. Yeah, I'm gonna throw this in here. I'm gonna you know do that, but also being humble enough to sit back and go. This isn't about me. You know, this isn't this isn't my show. Um, I'm gonna sit back and you know wait for my moment or kind of realize like yeah that's that, yeah. No, i'm not going to be able to you know get something in there right now or whatever so you you sit back and you know it, it's it's that whole thing of looking around going what's my part in this right now if you know looking around going what can i do to make the show better yeah you know yeah and to to encompass uh the time that you spent with bob and tom uh, what are some of the unforgettable moments that you've gotten to experience as the producer? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, uh, as a kid growing up, you know, I, I was always into uh, to music and, you know, uh, rock music and, and that kind of stuff. And so we've had, you know, plenty of guests over the years that, you know, I just couldn't have imagined uh, meeting. And, and like, you know, some of them, uh, I, I'm a especially growing up, I was a big Moody Blues fan. And, uh, and, you know, one day, you know, get the chance, you know, John Lodge and Justin Hayward too, with the, you know, the main guys from the Moody Blues were, you know, in there and I'm getting to hang out with them and, and talk uh-huh. to them and stuff, you know, and, and you know, Ozzy Osbourne, uh, gosh, it's, I, you know, all the different people that have come through there, you know, Eddie Money, Peter Frampton, Eddie Money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah Sa- Sandy Williams, a great guitar player. Uh, and I uh, got to back up Eddie Money, just like the, just the three of us, you know, me, yeah. Sandy and Eddie are sitting there in a little studio rehearsing, you know, running through doing this acoustic version of two tickets to paradise, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, they're really fun moments like that. And then just, you know, different, comedians through the years that would come through and uh and yet i think to me part of the fun part of what makes it kind of magic sometimes is when Mm -hmm. you you're you're working with these people and you 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 almost don't even notice or think about you know because i think that i started so young doing it you know i was just you know 22 and i was around all these people who were you know, could be very intimidating stuff, but at the same time, it's like, this is work, you know, it's just like, you got to do whatever you got to do. You know, I'm either prepping them for the show and, you know, going through stuff with them or, you know, whatever I'm doing, talking to them. And after a while, uh, you realize like, yeah, these are all just people and it's just work. And most of the time, you know, uh, I remember Steve Miller uh, was one of those guys that, you know, we had, we'd been prepped, you know, kind of somebody was telling us, oh yeah, yeah, he's really, you know, serious and difficult and whatever. Like we'd, we'd heard all this stuff about him mm-hmm. and then, and then he shows up and he's just this, you know, funny goofball, you know, easygoing guy. 
and uh, you know those are, those are the fun ones where you just you know you're dealing with these these people and it just turns into you know you're hanging out talking to this guy and and yeah. working with him and it's uh you know very laid back and and fun in a lot of cases other times there are you know there are guys that would be really intimidating and standoffish and you know you're just trying to figure out how to you know okay how do i get through this how do i keep this moving and you know and all that but that's to me that's part of the fun challenge is just trying to figure out that communication of you know trying to read people and trying to you know make the best of it yeah, reading the room again, right? How important that Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah. Same thing. It, it 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 applies everywhere in life, I think, you know. Yeah. Being a uh, radio producer is only one part of you. There's there's more parts to Dean, uh including <laughs> the idea uh and the thing that you are very talented at, playing guitar, being involved with several bands. Uh what how many bands are you in? Uh, yeah, I you know, I always used to joke that I was uh I was in I think uh, six bands. I think it was, it, it, for the for for a long time. It's like, yeah, I'm in six bands, and I have to be in that many so that I can play about once a month or so. <laughs> so it's, you know, none of the bands play very often. Uh, uh, at least through the years, it, it kind of was that way. Where so I was playing in two or three different bluegrass bands, and then a couple of little you know throw together you know rock party band kind of things and then we've got our uh our band the electric amish sure. which uh is the goofy uh, parody amish band and uh so n- yeah none of them would play that regularly so that that's what also made it fun you know i think that um uh you know obviously your dad uh, was a great musician and, and uh played a ton uh and, and i think that if i I don't. I don't think I would like being a full-time musician, making my living that way, because that that would turn it into work, you know. Yeah. And, and for me, it was always just this side thing for fun, and so, so it's you know, it's a blast when I get to do it. But I think that if if it, if it were something where I had to play, you know, three or four nights a week or whatever that turned into, um. I, I think that would be tough because uh, I've always admired professional, you know, musicians, comedians, entertainers that can go out there night after night yep. and and put on that show, you know, because it, it, you know I know you know damn good and well there are times they are up there miserable, <laughs> you know, either they're sick or they're going through something awful in their personal life or whatever. And they're giving it 110 percent, putting on this show and making people think, "Oh, they're having the time of their life," you know. Yeah. And that's that's a skill. I mean, that's an amazing thing. And um, you know, I've even with the Bob and Tom show, I've seen it. I've seen you know. That's again why I always say I've got the best job because I'm in you know my little room off to the side, and I can you know I can pitch in and do stuff and all that. But if I'm having a bad day, I can just kind of keep my head down and. You know, not not have to do all that, but I've seen all those uh, everybody on that show going through some really tough personal things, yeah, and not letting it show. You know, they're going on the air and just you know working through it. And that's that's a skill. Well, and you know, uh, I'm gonna uh, honor my dad here. He embodied that uh, through and through with each gig that he did. Uh, I know one thing that bothered him a lot with the gigs that he did in his later years was that, you know, the innovation of sports bars, there's TVs every three feet, Um, you know, so people are watching TV while trying to, you know, while he's trying to perform and it kind of took away from the performance. And I think, I really think that's a lacking uh, thing in society anymore is the live performance. Oh man. It's yeah, it's, it's huge. And, yeah, I've, you know, I've I've been in those uh, in those situations too with our bands where you're playing this little bar, and you know the whoever's hired you or whatever, it's like you know, oh yeah, we're gonna have you guys playing over here. But, oh yeah, the IU game is on, so a bunch of people could be over there at the <laughs> bar watch or whatever. And you're just like, okay, and you know, typically, 
either there'd be some of our friends and family or whatever there. So they're with us. And, right. you know, so they're kind of watching stuff. But there's this huge part of the bar. So you would you'd be playing some song and you're going along and, you know, yeah, we're rocking it out and all that. And then all of a sudden you just hear the bar erupt. You go, woo, going crazy, you know, in the middle of a song. And you realize it's like nobody's listening to us. They're all, you know, excited about the game or whatever. Um, and, you know, we, it, what your dad was doing, you know, he's up there. I mean, he, you know, he's a performer. He was a performer. He, you know, he was a real musician. Yes. And, you know, the, usually the bands, you know, a lot of the bands I play with, you know, we're just, you know, goofy little party bands and it's no big deal. But yeah, when I see, you know, these talented musicians having to play in these bars and they're, they're putting their heart and soul into this and they're trying to, you know, sing some really bluesy tune and, and put it out there and there's just you know the people are just talking over it not paying attention or yeah worse yet there's a tv on in the background that you know that they won't shut off yeah and, and it's awful it's it, as a performer it's awful but i think that that's also the real shame of it is that uh yeah like you said live music live performance is this amazing thing and it it's one of the big things that I, I think that a lot of people are really craving and missing right now with the with the COVID, uh, you know, with the, the shutdown and all that kind of stuff. Getting together in a room with a bunch of people and watching a live performance, it, it's this this magical thing of you know anything could happen. You know, you don't know how this is going to go. It's not like watching a TV show where, you know they hit play and it's like okay it's going to be the same thing every time yeah it's live you know and really i mean getting back to radio with our show i think it's the same thing where live radio it's a different deal um than listening to uh, a pre-recorded uh, show or whatever there, there's a magic first of all for the listener you know where they're going oh man this is you know they're live on the air what's going on but for the performers for the talent in the room it's a whole different deal we've we've uh, had things in the past where we've had to like record a segment or record uh, uh, you know something ahead of time record an interview you know uh, that, that'll run later and you just feel it in the room it's like there's this edge that's just not quite there because you there's this safety net you know you feel like oh yeah it's not that big a deal if somebody you know screws up or whatever we'll just edit that part out sure but with live you've got that you know that tension and that oh oh anything could happen better be careful oh oh, we gotta, oh i can't believe you said that <laughs> you know and, and i think saturday night live you know it's the, the same thing that they you know realized years ago you know it's like there's it's something different when it's uh you know live well, and you've also been uh, an on-air performer uh, for the Bob and Tom Show, performing several characters. Um, Jumbo the Elephant, uh, the Pope, uh, are among my favorite. A lot of that is off the cuff and just off the top of your head, right? Yeah, and that's and that's really the stuff that I like is is again that kind of live improv thing where you know you you don't really know where things are going to go and people are just ad-libbing and kind of going with it um yeah there are definitely you know we have uh you know definite bits um that are you know pre-written uh and a lot of the like the recorded stuff like the mr obvious show yeah um, and, and those kind of things that are pre-recorded bits those are fun and you know those are great too but uh i i always enjoy those uh those kind of natural um things where there'll be some news story and there'll be you know some some uh, somebody in the story where uh, I'll call in and and uh, kind of assume that role or whatever and, yeah. and just kind of play with it and it's fun because it's you know you again anything could happen it's live you never know where it's gonna go and uh, and I've always said that it, what's what's great about uh, the other great thing about live radio I think is that the audience the listeners they kind of get it like they don't they don't necessarily understand exactly how all the sure. you know, the moving parts work but i think they feel it and they get it and they understand that it's like they are so forgiving and forgetful where it's like okay maybe this guy calls in 
three or four times and nothing happens and it's kind of boring and stupid or whatever. But then that fourth or fifth time where just something hilarious happens and they love that. And I think that they're very forgiving in that way of like, you know, oh no, that's cool. You know, they, they don't care that it kind of tanked those other times. They remember those big ones and those good ones and how, how fun that is. And, and I think that that's, that's part of that magic that again, you can't, you can't really uh, recreate it or fake it. Uh, you know, same with, you know, like live performance where when, you know, just some cool little improv type thing happens. It's, uh, it's, it's just, that's, that's, that's what we all crave, I think. And, you know, keep yeah. going back for, yeah. One of the things that you do with, uh, your bands, uh, is play instruments. What instruments do you play? Um, so I always think of myself as mainly a, a guitar player. That's what I grew up, you know, starting out. I started yeah. playing guitar when I was about 13 and, um, it really never got to that, uh, I'm not a great, you know, like lead guitar player and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm, you know, pretty, pretty competent on uh, getting around on, on guitar. But then several years ago, I, because I, uh, I love bluegrass music, but the guitar stuff is just way over my head. I mean, the, these bluegrass guitar players are just so good. The guys that can really. Uh, flat pick and play uh, lead and all that so just almost as a uh, prop <laughs> I, I bought an upright bass uh, probably gosh 20 25 years ago it's been a long time yeah um, and I thought they're so cool you know it'd be fun to mess around with well it's like as soon as you own an upright bass you are pretty much automatically in a bluegrass band uh, <laughs> that's kind of the way it works it's like uh it's like if you own a pa system you are in a band you know you're in a rock band now um so so yeah it, it was kind of trial by fire where uh, these buddies of mine are like you know oh man we really need a bass player you know come on you know do this thing and it's like i don't i don't know how to play bass you know it's like i barely know how to you know do this and luckily i mean bass you know it's easily transferable you know the guitar skills are easily transferable to it sure um but but luckily it was just like it was like a four hour outdoor gig at a pumpkin farm kind of thing of just playing bluegrass music in the background so it's the perfect place to kind of you know learn um but yeah and it was it's a blast i mean i love i love doing it and and it's so much fun um and, and it's so you know it's it's the same and yet different than than uh being you know playing with a little rock band and all that but uh yeah. but acoustic acoustic music like that is just to me it's just magical uh when you get a group of guys together jamming and playing but yeah bluegrass and then um uh, and you've seen us uh, before a band called Area Code Eight One Two with sure. uh, Tim Tim Wright, and Michael Clark, and that one's a blast because you know we're uh, playing kind of a variety of stuff, but it's essentially like a bluegrass trio type thing. Um, and those guys are so good, um, and and it's just it's always a joy playing with them because I you know I, I get to learn so much uh, from those two, and we just we have you know really good chemistry together and just love playing together. It's just fun. I love listening to your band, The Tempos, too, man. I saw you guys not too long ago before the pandemic hit. So yeah, love The yeah. Tempos. It, and that's again, that's just that's just fun because it's just a bunch of buddies, you know, getting together and and playing. And that's what I always say. It's like you know, what we lack in talent, we make up for in fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it it really is. It's just you know. We're, we're having a good time up there playing. I think because of that, you know, it's just, it's infectious and people, uh, people enjoy it. And we try to, you know, we try to get a variety of songs that are, uh, you know, familiar, but maybe songs they haven't heard in a while and all that. The yeah. night that I caught so. with, with that band was Beatles night. I think every song was either a Beatles song or then you would <laughs> say, uh, Paul McCartney, after he left the Beatles, went to form a band called Wings, and here's the song <laughs> by that band, you know? So, um, yeah, and, and, you know, that, and that's what happens. It's like, you know, um, everybody in the band, you know, we're, we're all Beatles fans and all that. So, yeah, and, and 
it's hilarious because as we'll you know talk about we'll add songs or somebody will throw one in and go oh yeah we should learn this one or whatever and, yeah and at one point i mean it was it was like we start looking at the list it's like okay guys these are it, we're like literally doing about half beatles song you know it's like we're not a beatles tribute band and yet you know that's what we've got on here so yeah so we we try to dial it back every now and then but some, sometimes we'll just lead into it and have fun uh, going back to that stand-up bass, I know that you're also a, a guitar collector, and we'll get into your collection of uh, <laughs> presidential memorabilia as well. Um, but was the stand-up bass a, a purchase that was just meant for the collection at first, do you think? You know, it, I guess in a way, um, and that's, that's what I was saying, that it, like, I think I almost bought it as a prop. Like, Like, I thought, I don't know if I'll ever really play this thing or learn how to play it or you know anything like that but uh-huh. i thought if nothing else it'll look really cool in the house you know and my and my wife uh shannon you know shannon she she actually um uh played upright bass just for a little while as a kid as a little kid and i still picture you know this poor you know little this tiny little uh <laughs> middle school girl having to drag this upright bass onto her you know bus back and forth to school for a while um i'm sure she was popular oh my gosh you know that's i i just felt so bad for and she you know she said she was now she's i didn't have much talent for it so it didn't last long but uh but yeah so so she had a soft spot for upright bass too so you know we we bought I, i found this old beat up uh you know k bass from the 60s and uh, and brought it home, and I'm messing around with it, you know. And, and like I say, my bluegrass buddy's like, "No, no, yeah, you can do it. Come on, come on, it's easy. Here we go," you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that at, at that point, I, you know, I I already had uh, a, a little guitar collection uh, going for sure. But yeah, I never imagined that I would start uh, grabbing a whole lot of basses. But I think I've got I've got about five upright basses at this point. What do you look for in a guitar that you're wanting to collect? You know, I, I, I just buy stuff that I like, you know, that, that jumps out at me. So I'm, I'm not uh, one of those collectors that's looking for some mint, pristine, you know, a, a perfect example of this, you know, particular instrument. Uh, so a lot of times I'll, I'll buy guitars that are, uh, that have, you know, damage or have been changed out or whatever which you know hurts their collectability value and it's uh, uh-huh. what you know collectors would call a player's grade or a, you know it's a player it's not a collector so i that's that's really what i have more of i do have i do have some really cool really uh some some valuable instruments that are uh, that are really um uh, amazing and all that but for the most part uh, the majority of the stuff that I get are like, you know, oh yeah, I've always wanted one of those, you know, so I'll, I'll find a bargain yeah. or whatever. Um, but yeah, like the, to me, one of the coolest things I've got, I've got a, so Martin guitar is a, a really good brand of American guitars that have been around for, you know, uh, 150 years or whatever, 175 years. And I've got a, a Martin guitar that was built in the late 1850s wow so yeah so that that, you know to me it's just like that's so cool to imagine you know this guitar was around before the civil war you know and somehow survived all this time yeah and it's 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 this you know guitars weren't really big physically big back then so they were you know like they it's what we call now parlor size so it's like a small body guitar and it feels it's so lightweight feels like nothing and then you play it and it's like holy cow this this huge warm sound comes out of it uh that just almost seems unimaginable um and Mm. and just to imagine the original cf martin you know the guy that started the company he he would have either you know worked on built or done the final inspection or something on this guitar he would have had his hands on it you know it's just that that kind of stuff is so cool to me well and going through a lot of uh dad's old material and and instruments man i mean there there are some authentic old instruments uh and devices that you just you can't recreate it it's 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 close you know but it's not quite there so i yeah i can understand where you're coming from Oh yeah, and it's you know there there are guys that 
that will geek out on you know yeah the the really 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 uh you know the pure uh exact you know original things and honestly it's like yeah some of it really is it's it's for real you know it's like you cannot get that sound any other way Mm -hmm. and and a little bit of it a lot of times is just kind of that that mojo and that you know magic thing where it's like you know technically speaking you know this this thing this modern thing actually sounds better and does a better job of doing what that you know that vintage thing does yeah um but it didn't matter you know it's like it yeah, it doesn't matter. The, the, using those old devices and those old things, that's that's how they did it back then. So yeah. if you really, truly want to get that sound, you know, plug it into that thing and an old guitar and an old amp, and there it is. Uh, I do have a presidential item that might be worthy of your collection. If uh-oh, you're... uh-oh, what do you got? What do you got? I have a life-size cutout of George W. Bush. Wow. So what, like, how did you run across that? Or what was the uh, I think, there? I, I forget what it was. Uh, may have been some kind of convention or political ordeal that dad was playing at. And, you know, dad's the first to arrive <laughs> and the last to leave. And, you know, the, the cutout's still there and he just grabbed it. And <laughs> I, I, I think we had used it to kind of distract uh, birds from mating season. You know, we put it in the window so that... <laughs> They, uh, you know, they'll run into the window or, or not run into the window because they're seeing the G Dub, yeah. you know, G Dub. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if that's worthy of your collection, but you're you're more than welcome to have it. Oh my gosh, no, I love I, I love all that stuff, and that's what I've I've uh, accepted many gifts over the years from people who are like, you know, it's like, hey, I've I've got this thing, and a lot of times it is, it's like, you know, uh, this is my dad's, and that, and I don't really have any use for it, but I'd love to. You know, they like it's not necessarily worth a lot or whatever. So it's not like they're, you know, I I could sell this on eBay for a bunch of money, but they just kind of know it's like I don't have the heart to throw this away, and somebody might want it. Right. So I've got a bunch of little cool things like that in my collection, like little, you know, books or uh, you know, yeah, uh, an ashtray or a you know a little figurine, whatever it is. Um, yeah, and I love that stuff where. Uh, you know, it's just, it's been in somebody's family and sitting around and, uh, and I, and what I really like is the, the, the goofy, kitschy kind of, um, uh, like, like I've got a trash can, you know, this mm. metal trash can from, uh, probably the seventies, you know, that has all the president's pictures on it and, uh, uh on a, a trash a can of, of all items, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's the thing. It's like, <laughs> you'll find all these different uh things with you know either individual presidents or a collection or whatever yeah and and you do like one of my favorites it's like i don't know who thought of this or why but i've got a a collection of pocket knives so it's it's all the presidents up to i think it's up to gosh reagan or bush i can't remember um but these pocket knives, like these commemorative pocket knives that some company made. So I just love the oddball stuff like that that uh, that people have marketed through the years. Oh yeah, and y- you know, um, do you do you plan on continuing to collect as we add to the the amount of presidents in this country? You know, I mean, I've I. I I started, gosh, I'm trying to think, because really this whole, this fascination started when I was a kid. So I was, you know, uh, in third grade or whatever, and I memorized the president, so I was just fascinated. And so it's been like this lifelong thing. So at that point, it was, the, I can remember, yeah, Nixon, you know, reti- uh, resigning, and, you know, Ford and Carter. So, I mean, that period, so the, all the ones past that are, you know, new presidents to me. Um yeah. But yeah, I, I, I and I don't want to get political here to talk about that, but you know, I'm not I'm not a big fan of the current president and and all that, but that's not, you know, it's not what this is about because uh this is about the office and the 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 presidency and the the stuff, you know, just the the collection. So yeah, I mean I I definitely am not um you know, an avid like out there seeking, you know, stuff um, but but basically I'll run across stuff or I'll see something, you know, that sure. piques my interest that I get a kick out of. And, uh, and like I say, the, the goofier stuff, the novelty stuff, uh, I, I enjoy. But yeah, as far as, you know, uh, 
the 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 Trump stuff that you know there's there's all kinds of uh, pro Trump things out there marketed and you know even some anti you know some joke stuff and all that but I yeah I just don't really go out and, and look for all that kind of stuff but as you know uh, some uh, collector plate or some you know some thing comes out with all the presidents you know through Trump it's like you know yeah I I, I always like uh, having having that kind of stuff in that has the the whole bunch of them on there. Are the wax figures still in the guest room? Absolutely. Frank and Grover. <laughs> Frank and Grover are hanging out. Uh, they, uh, they, they've they become best of friends. Uh, <laughs> and, that, so that, and that's what I was thinking about with your, uh, your cardboard cutout uh, of Bush. You know, it's like, now, did, have you guys treated him with respect and all that? Uh, yeah. Have you guys been nice to George? He deserves that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Come on, president. <laughs> but yeah, that, that, and that's when, when I got these wax figures uh, at the uh, you know the auction from the wax uh, hall of presidents in uh, right. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. That that was one thing that they you know really tried to you know instill in everybody. You know, it's like we we really hope and you know want you know, all of anyone buying these presents to treat them with respect and, you know, not, you know, not use them for some, you know, uh, and I don't even know exactly what they were picturing. I mean, and then, you know, fast forward and you, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but, uh, uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, he, he bought five, I think of those wax presidents and he's done, you know, these goofy little, uh, fake films with them and stuff like that you know and it's like i'm thinking i i don't know if that's respectful i don't know from the same auction as the one that you went to oh yeah oh yeah. wow okay <laughs> yeah because yeah. in in the deal was um yeah so he bought he bought five and then i'm trying to remember who else uh bought uh oh wait hang on one second here there we go sorry i hit a wrong my uh for some reason my speakerphone turned on oh, that's okay. um uh, Rachel Maddow bought one. Um, John Stewart bought one. Um, John Oliver uh, bought, yeah, bought one. Of the, uh, and so all these different, you know, people were uh, had had you know either sent people or bidding by phone. And that's what I did. I I was bidding by phone because I couldn't get out there uh, for the auction. Uh, and then and then uh, as I you know I ended up winning two of the the bids so now i've got two wax presidents to pick up and it turns out like yeah. you know you had to pick them up within just a few days and so i had to basically take off late on a saturday night after winning this auction to hustle over there to get my presidents uh, home on sunday um and but, uh, you, you ended up putting uh pierce in the in the back seat right well yeah so the so i had my my uh, trusty uh, Honda minivan that I you know, haul uh, musical gear in and all that. And uh, yeah, so Pierce was lying down in the back of the van and, uh, and his head is uh, off in a box. Right. And then um, Grover, Grover Cleveland, he, for some reason, like a few of the, the, uh, the figures uh, were seated you know their their bodies are <laughs> built to sit and and there's a chair and everything so so Grover is seated so he uh, actually rode shotgun on the way home he he sat you know in the passenger seat <laughs> of my van you know strapped in there and it was so funny because I'm just thinking like oh my gosh yeah all oh, people are gonna be looking and pointing and asking questions are not a peep i went through i went through i had to go through a couple of toll booths i had to, I, I stopped for you know fast food <laughs> at one point and and, and i did i kind of looked at the the you know the young woman worked at the fast food i go hey you know who that is and she kind of looks over there and she goes no and i go it's grover cleveland you know our 22nd and 24th president yeah. and she just like looks again she goes cool <laughs> i mean like like you could tell she thought oh my god this guy is nuts or whatever but she it wasn't you know she wasn't freaked out about it or anything she's like oh 
great. And and uh, same with the toll booth. I mean, they just didn't bat an eye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dean, you know, you, you've done a lot uh, in radio. You continued to uh, involve yourself with music. Um, done a lot of things. Uh, what's something else that you want to try that's new at some point? Mm, new stuff, huh? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I. I think that I've always been kind of, uh, you know, take things as they come, you know, and kind of be sure. ready, you know, to, to, uh, you know, oh, that might be cool. Let's try that. Uh, so I, I can't really think of stuff that I'm, you know, hell bent to do or try or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think I, 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 one opportunity that, you know, has happened just because of, uh, uh, bec- partly because of the Bob and Tom show of just, having you know a little bit of that notoriety and name recognition is i've been able to uh, do some some good uh, stuff in the animal community uh i'm on the board of uh, the friends foundation which uh benefits the indianapolis animal care services which is you know the city the city shelter the city pound right. um, that serves all of marion county and uh so i you know i enjoy being able to do some stuff like that where you know get to volunteer, uh, volunteer my time and what, what little talent I've got, uh, however that, you know, can help, um, in community ways. And I, and I get involved with other charity events and different things as well. Uh, but, uh, the animal, animal stuff is, uh, near and dear to my heart and, uh, and my wife. So we've, you know, through the years we've been involved, uh, off and on with animal rescue and we've, we've, uh, fostered dogs and all that. And we're, big dog people over here so that's that's been a nice uh kind of side side benefit of uh of this this job and this uh crazy career where can people uh get involved or make a donation for that yeah if you uh if you just really if you go to indygov you know there's just the the website for the city uh you can find it on there but um but, but it's right. basically if you just look up friends of Indianapolis animal care services uh, you'll you'll find the foundation and and the idea is the the uh, because the city um, shelter it's all through the you know the city government in the old days um, people would want to donate to the shelter to help out and the way things were set up uh, if you gave them a hundred dollars, it had to go into the city <laughs> coffers, you know, it had to go to the city and then it would trickle down where only the little tiny itty bitty percentage that went to animal care services, that's the only part that they would actually get. Okay. So literally like, you know, pennies out of that hundred dollars. So about, Oh, it's been over 15 years or so ago. Uh, a group got together and said, "Look, we're gonna form a foundation so that we can be the fundraising arm and that we can kind of direct where those funds go um, for the shelter." So now, you know, if you give a hundred dollars to the Friends Foundation, a hundred dollars goes straight to the shelter, and and we get to you know kind of help figure out what to do with that money. So. Uh, you know, the city with the budget and everything, it's, it's tough, you know, for them to, because they, by law, they have to take care of all of those animals. And they, you know, if somebody, if somebody, if there's a loose alligator, if there's a <laughs> loose camel on the streets, uh, anything like that, that they, by law, have to take care of these animals and uh, deal with them. So yeah. it's, it's not like, um, you know, other shelters where, you know, like the Humane Society or uh, some of the little rescue groups or whatever, you know, they can kind of pick and choose and go, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll take that. We'll take that, you know, but, you know, those other things, are, no, 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 take it down to animal care services. Right. So, so what we've done through the years is we've really worked on trying to improve the conditions for those animals, make them more adoptable, get more out. And, and it's pretty amazing because, um, you know, several years ago, the 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 rate the the survival rate was just incredibly low. Like literally, uh, about ten percent only only about ten percent wow. of the animals, yeah, would would make it out. You know, it was essentially just the animals would go to the shelter and they they weren't going to come out. 
and now all these years later it's fully flipped the other way so that uh it's only about 10 percent that don't make it out we're we're getting close to being a, a officially a no-kill shelter where the only you know animals that are put down are ones that are you know just have huge health uh problems or uh, aggression issues that you know can't be solved or whatever right so yeah so it's it's a it's a really cool thing um and uh i'm glad to be able to be a part of all that well and i'm glad to uh have had a chance to talk with you dean we so appreciate you uh taking some time man please come back <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Anytime. Good to yap with you. I'm glad to see you uh, out out there, you know, still still working on working on your career and becoming uh, becoming a broadcaster. You know, you used to just be, you know, this goofy little kid, you know, that I knew. Yeah. And now now you're this this goofy man that I know. Yeah. Isn't that weird how people grow up? Isn't that oh, weird? You, you have no idea, kid. You have no idea. Well, yeah, you'll these these you'll, you'll see these babies born, and then all of a sudden, you know, fast forward, and they're out talking and having kids themselves. It's crazy. Well, and and, and before long, who knows? I might be the next Dean Metcalf. I can hope for that. Oh boy, let me know. I'll I'll be <laughs> glad to turn over my ID and everything to you. And give you all the all the secrets and the keys to the kingdom. All right, my man. We appreciate you. Uh, we'll Thanks talk. We'll talk to you soon, pal.